Thanks for watching on YouTube. Please check out all of our great sponsors in the description below the video. Welcome to Allocation Disorder. I am Sam Stasekul, joined as always by Paul Tenorio, coming to you on your favorite podcast feed and on the Athletic Soccer YouTube page. You can find us there. Link in the description for those of you interested in seeing our smiling, beautiful faces on camera. Um, Paul, how's it going, man? I'm a little worried because usually you say my friend and colleague, and maybe I'm on, on your know. bad side today. Maybe you are. I guess we'll find out. Stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> Paul, there are a couple head coaches that were on the bad side of their MLS teams this week. Uh, Matias Almeida, we spoke about that situation on our last show uh, out in San Jose. The Earthquakes and him parted ways. They, the Quakes decided to fire him, made that official on Monday. Um, we don't need to talk too much about that decision because we talked quite a bit about San Jose last week, uh, but they did, they did actually make it right um, again, you know, kind of throwing away the entire season by not making a decision on him this off season. Uh, but so it goes for John Fisher and the earthquakes. Paul, what I want to talk about more today is DC United. They fired Hernan Losada on Wednesday. Somewhat surprising to, I think people that, that don't know what was going on behind the scenes. Um, they were two and four this MLS season. Uh, the last of those losses um, of which there have been four in a row in league play coming to Austin FC at home on Saturday, DC leading to nothing for most of that match playing down a man for basically the entire second half and then giving up three goals in the final 10 minutes to lose three to two to Austin. Um, that game caused issues to put it mildly. Uh, they ended up winning their open cup match against Flower City Union, which is a NISA team up in Rochester on Wednesday, or excuse me, on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday morning, Losada was fired. So what what do you make of this decision? We wrote an article about it with with our colleague, colleague Pablo Maurer that just published on The Athletic on Thursday. So check that out. But what do you make of this decision? What do you make of DC? What do you make of where they go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think it was I think it was both surprising and after the course of our reporting, maybe a little bit not surprising. You know, I certainly there were issues that existed below the surface. Um, what we see on the field every weekend isn't the only thing happening within a club. And there were relationships that were frayed between Losada and DC United's front office, between Losada and some of the players. And you know, it's been interesting just to kind of see the reaction from around the league and then even to see the reaction to our story and the early goings on the athletic website from some of the readers. Like, it's not mutually exclusive. The idea that, like, Losada had issues within the club and, you know, that this relationship was fraying and that there's a lot that has to be fixed at DC United that goes beyond Losada. And we'll get into all that later. I, I just want to make sure that that's clear. But I think that, you know, we have to acknowledge that the results haven't been good so far this season, that the end. They haven't been good, but it's still so, so early. Three, three, three of those four losses came at home. And, and at the end of last season, they went from third place to eighth place in the final month of the season. So I think we can acknowledge that things weren't haven't been going right, you know, at DC United. Right. But this is a, you know, it is a quick trigger. And I think that especially when you consider that they only just signed a DP who's only played, you know, in two games or one game, um, you know, the one player that they really spent money on after needed. losing, after losing two of their better players in Paredes and Paul Areola this right. off season. And, and, you know, I think that when you consider that side of things, my, my thought was like, I saw Jonathan Tannenwald tweeted this out when the announcement first happened which was like, okay, so you hire a guy, he coaches a year with with the previous coach's roster, you change over the roster dramatically. I mean, significant number of players went out at the end of last season, including the two you mentioned before. Ten players came in, and yet it's over after six games. That math feels a bit off to me. That math feels like there wasn't – like a, like minds might have already been made up going into this year, and it was about waiting for the right opportunity, which happens all the time, Sam. I don't know if I would go so far as to say that minds were made up heading into this year. I think if they were four and two instead of two and four, then we're not talk having this conversation sure. today, right? I think um, the mind, when I say that, I mean like if the moment arises, this isn't going to be like a we're gonna we're gonna see it out. Obviously not, right? Like right. 
and and clearly there had been deterioration basically communication breakdowns is i think the best way to describe this between losada and the front office and losada and some of the players too you know he was a very demanding very exacting coach in mls and there's nothing wrong with that right it's just kind of a messaging question like how much are you taking into account what the players want or what they need or what they think um how much are you listening to them are you giving them the opportunity to to even air their concerns and from our reporting, it sounds like there wasn't a lot of that going on with DC United. And when you combine that with difficult training sessions and a uh, weigh-ins and fines for not making weight um, and all of those things, and, and a coach who, who really wanted to control a lot of aspects of these players' lives, right? From diet to sleep to um, how hard they're working again to the weigh-in thing. Um, and when you combine the, the not really giving them a voice or not really listening to them with the demands then that becomes a little bit grading, right? And when you throw poor results on top of that, that can lead to an outcome like what we saw. The other element of this that I want to touch on is that Losada was not shy in the media about criticizing his own ownership and saying we need to spend more money on players, on different behind the scenes elements of our club and make this a more professional operation. And I had a source familiar with DC come to me and say, hey, it's one thing if the coach and the GM don't get along. That actually happens at many clubs in MLS, right? Owners don't necessarily care about that. Um, what they do care about is when you start calling them out publicly. That makes your leash significantly shorter. And I think that's sort of what we saw here with Losada. That's, that's an element to this story and an element and a reason why I think the leash was as short as it was and the, the hook was as quick as it was. Yeah, let's talk about that tension between a GM and a coach. It's it's normal and it's good in in a lot of ways. Like you have Sometimes. you have somebody who is going to who is actually actually controlling the roster, right? And what players get signed, and you have a coach who has desires of what players to sign and and how much money to spend. A coach is always going to want more. I think that's typical. Everyone likes to make fun of Adrian Heath about it. He always says we're one to two players away. Um, and you know, I covered him in Orlando and he said that stuff all the time. And like, that's, that's the tension that's always there. And it's about, you know, yeah, you want that tension to be there at a, at a professional level, right? Like it can go above that and then into the, the red zone where it becomes problematic. Right. But I think that, that, that natural tension is just part of the job. I, I also think that what Losada was saying was true. You know, there is a lot that DC United lags behind on when it comes to spending in this league. Yeah. And, and I think back to, I'm going to try not to mention the team or the, the, there was another team that was similar to DC United in um, a few years ago and how they operated. Um, very the low New budget, England revolution, very low budget, very bare bones on the stuff that you wouldn't see that you and I even wouldn't see really typically, but that, involves the players everyday lives including things like what are they eating when they come into the facility you know what does their weight room look like and this team brought in a player who had come from another better club and the first thing he did was go to the gm and start to say like you brought me in as a leader you brought me in as a as a captain and like so this, not the not the revolution this Find stuff needs, in the fire okay this stuff needs to change you know yeah. this stuff needs to change and and it wasn't Schweinsteiger, by the way. And, Dex um, okay. <laughs> and you know, I think that that's like probably the first way to go about it, right? To go internally. But I was struck by what Losada said when you go back and read his old quotes, you know, or quotes of players in a story that Pablo Maurer did last year, where you say that he was encouraging his players and saying, you have to put public pressure, otherwise things won't change. Yeah. And, you know, it's a fine line, though. That's a tightrope. It is. It's a tightrope, but it doesn't change the fact. And I, I keep coming back to this. He wasn't wrong. Like DC United today, a report came out that Gareth Bale is a DC United target. It's like the perfect to me, some like summary look over of there. what DC United yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. It's like, not only is it like, look over there, but it's like, Oh, like we need to show that we're invested in this club. Let's go sign like a 32 year old Wayne Rooney DP again for $6 million a year. 
and it shows that we're committed to spending. I mean, like, to be fair, Gareth Bale would be amazing in MLS. Sure. And Wayne Rooney was very good in MLS. He would be better than too. Rooney. I agree. Life. I well, yeah. if he's committed, right? You have to you have to keep that in mind. I mean, even if he's like not that committed, he would say. No, I think commitment of DPs is probably the biggest factor in their success. Golf, Wales, DC United in that order. Yeah. So I just my my point is is like that's not the way MLS works anymore. Like the league has moved on from one DP being a solution to truly what, what the idea of spending is like spending at a club to be successful long-term goes into infrastructure. Sure. And they built a stadium and they finally finished the training facility, but you know, scouting networks, uh, Academy investment, analytics, sports science, these are the things where you start to set your club up to have long-term success. In, in a capped league, it's where you can really make a marginal difference. There's no cap on any of that stuff. How right. much you're paying your coaches, which DC United was not paying. I, I interviewed Greg Vanny last week when he was here in Chicago for a story that will come out at some point when I sit down and write it. This DC United thing you know, changed my schedule a bit. Look the last for it in days. seven to eight months. <laughs> um and, you know, that's that's the stuff he talked about doing right away when he arrived in L.A. Is like you the Galaxy are a very similar idea of like, oh, let's go get a big Zlatan star who was great in this league. But if you don't have the infrastructure, it's hard to compete. That's yeah. that's the new MLS. Absolutely. And, and to me, Paul, this sort of all goes back to one thing. And this is something that we both got texts about like immediately after Losada was fired. Um, <laughs> and it was. Oh, this club is a mess. It's not, oh, Losada, what a surprise, or oh, he got a raw deal, or oh, this is the right thing to do. It was like it wasn't even about like the firing. It was about ownership and what are they doing? And do they actually have a plan? And what is the deal with DC United going forward? And like who would want to work for them? Who would? Like and, and they can change, right? But the way that Steve Kaplan and Jason Levian have run this club thus far hasn't been all that inspiring. And Paul, it was interesting. We were going back through an old interview that you did with Steve Kaplan. Well, I think in 2018, so three and a half years ago now. Um, but he was talking a pretty big game about being ambitious and really going for it and pushing the other owners to really go for it. And what have we seen DC United do since then? They moved Wayne Rooney. Uh, they moved Lucho Acosta. They shot themselves in the foot and cost themselves millions of dollars, according to what we've been told, on that PSG deal that that was and then wasn't um and they they signed edison flores um for a lot of money right five million bucks i think on the transfer fee he hasn't worked out um i don't think that's a that's a signing where you can question the ambition of owners it's certainly a signing where you can question the execution of the sporting department um but apart from flores there haven't been a ton of moves from this club that have really been like okay let's go for it i remember paul that 2018 season at Audi Fields and that moment with Wayne Rooney and that pass to Lucho Acosta and that header and just like how amazing that felt watching that live and thinking to yourself, okay, there's Lucho Acosta jumping into the stands. This place erupts and it's like, okay, is this the start of something new here for DC United? And it felt like that from then on in 2018 and then 2019, it just kind of backslid. And it hasn't been the same since. Some of that is COVID, I think, to be fair. But some of it is just this ownership group has, has taken their foot off the pedal big time. Yeah. I mean, again, you go and you look at how clubs respond to these big years. And and the idea, that's where the, you get protection from the, from the investment in infrastructure. Right? You have a scouting network that can help find you players because not every signing is going to be a DP. You know, that DC United team had Wayne Rooney and Lucho Acosta that they decided to keep Acosta. And, you know, you need to fill the rest of the roster with quality players from abroad as well as domestically. And, you know, I, I'm going to speak on this a little bit from my perspective of being a DC native, you know, growing up. You know, I remember when DC United launched. I remember watching the first game against the San Jose Earthquakes. I put on my Instagram page a, a home video that I found last year where I like did a teaser for the opening game against the earthquakes as a 10 year old. And 
What? I, yeah, I, I was like talking to my mom and out of the blue, I'm like, tonight on ESPN, <laughs> my DC United takes on the San Jose Earthquakes at 8 p.m., you know? And like, I remember going to RFK and, and seeing those crowds, the Barra Brava and, and watching Echeverry and Raul Diaz Arce and John Harks and Eddie Pope and, you know, what those teams were about and what the crowds were about. And DC United has been chasing that or they whether they are actively doing it or not they're always chasing that history but also that atmosphere that environment it was the first real soccer environment in major league soccer in my opinion and they haven't been able to get that and and i do agree with you in that i felt like maybe they had a chance when the rooney stuff was happening and acosta was jumping into the crowd and people were starting to pay attention and the, the atmosphere was starting to be lively again and it, you know, I just feel that you can't accomplish it when you are trying to do the bare minimum to be competitive. Like, I think that the, the, the crowds in DC, the fans in DC are able to pick and choose their product nowadays. You know, it's a very different city than when I grew up. It's, it's, you know, there are a lot of trans, like, tr uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Transient. Transient a population because of the government the way the government functions in the city and the market, a lot of people are coming in to work for the government, to work for all of the consultant firms that are there. And so you can go see the Caps who are good or the Nats when they're good. Or, I mean, no one goes to watch the football team because Dan Snyder, but you the have your choices. The yeah, you, you have your choices. And the soccer fans in that area, they either have, you know, don't like MLS in general or they feel like they the front office has burned them over time, or they're looking for a reason to show up. And those reasons haven't been there. And, you know, I I don't know. I know I'm rambling here a little bit, but like it it's crazy every time I go home and I go to a, a game at Audi Field. Like it's crazy to me that there is a soccer stadium in DC. You know, I, I just think that it's nuts. It, it blows my mind every time I see it. And so I try not to complain too much about the fact that that stadium is bare bones. Like it is, it is a bare bones stadium because it's a chance to go watch soccer in the city in a stadium you own. Yeah. Cause so ultimately like, the important thing is that it's a stadium that it exists after all those years of RFK. So my thing is like, okay, then do something with it now. Like you don't have the revenue drain of RFK anymore. You have a, a home stadium, like go and do something with it. But now. they have a weird ownership situation. They really do. And like that's, I think, at the heart of a lot of this. Steve Kaplan has the money. Jason Levian does not. Jason Levian has way more power than his money would indicate, basically. And he has a lot of say in these things in the day to day and, and, and whatnot. And he got the stadium deal done. He did the politicking there. And credit to him on that, man. Like, because that was something that they couldn't do for 20 years and he came in and he did it. Right. And, and that's super important. But, and I, we need to dive into this more, but like, I, I just wonder how much does the fact that, you know, this isn't a, a poor individual by any means, but relative to the billionaire owners like Joe Mansueto in Chicago, for instance, or John Fisher in San Jose, not that he's doing anything with it. He, he doesn't have that money, like not even close to that money. Like he's closer to you and I than he is to them, you know? And, and so how much does that fact affect what they can do from a spending perspective? Is, is it a situation where there are capital calls and he's not willing to put in and he doesn't want Steve Kaplan to put in because that would lower the percentage stake that he has in the team? I don't know. I don't know what their agreements are like. I don't know what their relationship is like contractually, but I do wonder about it. And I do wonder how much it holds this, this club back. Um, from a perspective how of how much they can invest on players, on infrastructure, on everything, um, and how much they can really take advantage of of the situation that they are in and were in back in 2018 when Kaplan was making those comments to you and Wayne Rooney was wowing the fans at Audi Field. I think what what should stand out from this segment, really to me, what stands out about it is those are the things we've just been talking about. Those are the things that are going to impact the success and the and the trajectory of DC United ownership, whatever the relationship is with Kaplan and Levian, um, their willingness to spend their 
desire to be more aggressive um, and to start to capitalize now that they've built the stadium and the training facility, you know, do they, what do they want to do? How much do they want to spend? Who do they want to be? Do they want to be Colorado and Philadelphia? Do they want to be Portland? You know, that you don't have to be Atlanta. It's it's convenient to be like, oh, we're, you know, we're not Atlanta. We're not LAFC. We're not NYCFC. You don't have to be that Toronto. You can be Portland. You can be Chicago right now, you know, and spending, you know, at a, a mid tier level on players. What do they want to be? That's that's to me the bigger problem and the bigger question versus changing out Hernan Losada for Chad Ashton. Like that's not going to make a long term impact at DC United, I don't think. I mean, who knows? It might. Maybe Chashton comes in and dazzles us. Maybe. You know. Um, the players seem to to like him for whatever that's worth. Um, we'll see. He'll have an opportunity for the rest of this season. Um, from from what's been reported by Pablo in our piece and by others elsewhere. Um, and if he does well, I fully expect he'll get that job yeah. on a permanent basis. Did well in 2020. Yeah, limited time though. I think only seven games, so small sample. Um, one more game than Hernando Lasada got this season, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Um, anyway, Paul, we're talking about owners. We're going to talk more about owners and specifically what makes a good owner in the next segment. So stay with us. We'll dive into that issue a little bit more. This episode is brought to you by Indochino. I have got a wedding coming up this summer. I've got several events that I have to look sharp for. Evidently, I cannot wear t-shirts and sweatpants to weddings and formal functions, but I can wear well-tailored, well-styled suits that will make me look like a million dollars without costing a million dollars, and that is the combination that we all would like. Indochino is who we're talking about. Indochino makes... High-quality custom-fitted suits, shirts, and casual wear, all at a surprisingly affordable price. And all of it is customizable. You can customize everything from suits and shirts to chinos and bomber jackets. And that means you're getting the buttons you want, the details you want, the pockets will look the way you would like them to look. And at the same time, it's going to be sleek and stylish, so it's your tastes, but then the tastes of people who are doing this at a professional level. Every piece that you're ordering is made to your exact measurements. As I said, you can customize everything. And they're always adding new pieces so you can stay on trend and in style. And you can do so for a very reasonable price. And that's why I have enjoyed Indochino in the past and genuinely do plan to use them again for this summer because you want to stay up to date with the styles. But also, if you're dieting or maybe you've put on a few pounds, you don't want to wear the suit that's two sizes too small and everybody can see the white socks that you didn't want to wear but you forgot to pack black socks and now you're an embarrassment you never want to be the embarrassment instead you want to be the well-styled james bond looking person uh, at the wedding this season dress to impress on every occasion with indochino get 50 dollars off any purchase of 399 dollars or more by using the promo code tss at indochino.com that's 50 dollars five zero dollars off a purchase of 399 dollars or more at indochino i-n-d-o-c-h-i-n-o.com Promo code TSS. Thank you to Indochino for sponsoring today's episode and keeping us all looking fly. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy, who would like to let us know that people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, undereating, and overeating. All of those things seem bad. The digestive issues I knew because in The Sopranos, Adriana has some issues when she's got some stress in her life. Uh, That does not go well for her. Uh, For me, uh, the teeth grinding is definitely a thing that uh, occurs when I am stressed out, especially in my sleep, apparently. Uh, I guess I keep a clenched jaw, which is not great for relieving tension. You know what it is, is talking about the reasons for that tension and processing it and then moving on in a healthy way. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And it's incredibly easy. That has been a big difference maker for myself and for a lot of people, I think, is that you can kind of get access when you need it, get help when you need it, just get little messages of support, whatever it might be. It goes a long way towards helping you feel functional and comfortable in society or in family environments or whatever it might be. And what it also is, is more affordable than in-person 
in-person therapy so you can give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress and maybe your bills. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Total Soccer Show listeners can get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash T-S-S. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash T-S-S. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring today's episode. Welcome back to Allocation Disorder. We spent some time listening to me ramble about DC United incoherently because I get upset when that team is not good. <laughs> but Way to sell leads, the show, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but it leads us it leads us into this question, really, Sam, which is like for all of our complaining that we both like to do and that lots of fans like to do, and and I think a lot of the conversations we have uh, with sources, what makes a good MLS owner? Well, I think the first question that I would respond to that question with is what are the owner's intentions, right? Is what, what is the main motivation here? Is it a vehicle for investment and for financial gain? Is it a vehicle for winning and pride and civic uh, happiness and all of those things? Um, is it a vehicle to try and grow the sport? in this country. Um, and if it's yes to the first one, then I think you have problems right off the bat. I'm not saying there can't be any financial motivation in this game, but I think the primary thing for an MLS owner should be, or ideally is like, Hey, I'm here to win. I'm here to build something sustainable and I'm here to kind of grow the game in the United States. And that might mean financial pain in the short term, but in the long term, I'm betting me being a billionaire owner of a major league soccer team, that it will pay dividends in, in the long run. And I will eventually be profitable. And even before I become profitable, my stake, right, my valuation of my club will rise, maybe dramatically, or maybe incrementally. And so I think that's, that's the first question. And then everything else kind of follows, right? Like, are you making big, ambitious signings? Are you building a competent academy? Are you running your organization in a way that makes sense from a just an organizational perspective? Are you creating systems on the commercial side, on the sporting side, where you can sustain success regardless of who's in charge, right? Are you creating a good culture? Um, do you have a stadium, right? Like, do you have a soccer-specific stadium or do you have a stadium like the ones that we see in Atlanta or even Seattle where it's not soccer-specific, but it's, you know, built with with the purpose of soccer in mind um and and then you know do you behave well <laughs> right like because that's been an issue in mls here over the last couple of years in, in salt lake in portland right and are you are you kind of doing the right things in the community and and with your own players in regards to social issues um so those are some of the questions that that i would look at in terms of a good owner but the the big one is what are your intentions and do you intend to win or are you in this, you know, because it's a good, it's a good investment and it's growing exponentially and you can, you know, make, make some real estate money on the side too. Yeah. And, and don't forget about political capital. You know, you, as a, as an owner of a professional sports team in a city, you get access to politicians that even billionaire money can't buy you all the time. It puts you in different rooms um, because you have that civic role right? You are a part of the community, whether you like it or not. And, and, and it does change the dynamic. It certainly makes you, uh, you know, a, a name that gets talked about more. You know, David Tepper was always a billionaire. He was a different kind of billionaire when he was, became the Panthers owner, David Tepper. So that, let's not forget about that part as well. I yeah. think, you know, for me, there is, if we're going to get that down to like the actual soccer side of it specifically, I think you hit the nail on the head when you were when you were asking the questions about what is the plan? Like what type of team do you want to be? What type of franchise, club, whatever? I know there's a big debate about what to call it in MLS. Like, do you want to be? <laughs> um, when I say big debate, I mean like 12 people on Twitter. But you know, and that 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 extends to your community work, that extends to your commercial uh, strategy. And certainly it's evident on the soccer side. Like I have no problem with Philadelphia being what they are because that is their plan. Their plan is to be academy driven. FC Dallas, their plan is based around an academy model that, that develops players, plays them and sells them. Mm. I, so I think that 
you have to have a, an idea of that. Now, in order to truly be competitive, to be a, a winner, like the question is, do you want to just develop players or do you want to win? Do you want to try to win trophies, right? That's the next level. Yeah. And if your if your goal is to be a winning team that that and your model is like Ajax, like we are going to win and develop players, right? Then you there's a difference. Like Ajax doesn't just play the players they develop; they also actively purchase players in Europe in order to win, right? That's what FC Dallas has been missing. Like they they've been amazing at developing players; they've been terrible at turning that into real results on the field and trophies. At least over um, the last half decade. Well, they, when they were winning trophies under Oscar Brea, that was before the academy yeah. players were playing. Oh, it's not, not not entirely true. I mean, yeah. they weren't playing to the level that they are now. There were like two academy players getting consistent minutes in 2016, maybe three. So, you know. Yeah. Point just two. go take a look at that roster. Not you, but people who say that. that <laughs> Hold on. Let me Google it. Training. It was Kellen Acosta and Victor Ulloa, and I believe that was before Jesse Gonzalez started playing. Right. So, I mean, the, the base of that team was Mauro Diaz and Fabian Castillo, neither of whom were homegrown players. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think there has to be a, a willingness to invest in who you want to be as a club. And then and then I think there I think there's the, the most interesting side when it comes to the soccer part is a willingness to give that money, that investment to the people you empower in your in your organization the COO, the CSO, to, to give them the investment to, to accomplish that goal and to know when to be hands off as well. Yeah. And, and that's a really hard thing for people to do. Because Not even hands money. off, just empower the people that you empower have. Empower the people you have and, and, and don't kind of step on their toes when they're trying to put into place like what you've hired them to do. Um, but I, I have no same. We talk about this all the time. You know, when I brought up Dallas and Philadelphia, what I'm trying to say is like, I have no problem if every team wants to do it differently. I mean, MLS doesn't really let you do it differently too much, but like you can find different models to be successful. Not every team has to be Toronto signing a $12 million DP. Well, but this gets into an interesting area for me. And that's the specific area of soccer in the US and in Canada and where it stands and where MLS says it wants to take it, yeah. right? And if MLS wants to be one of the best leagues in the world, and if it wants to be a cultural phenomenon, and if it wants to be a real part of our sporting landscape in a way that it is plainly not right now, then I think some of these owners have a deeper responsibility, right? And, and what, when you say, okay, if you wanna be an academy focused club, and you want to do it like Philly and Dallas, do it. Well, yeah, I have no objection to that from a purely sporting perspective. Like none at all, right? And and what they do, they they both have done pretty well, in my opinion. But when you're talking about the other side of it, which is such a huge part of this, man, it's such a huge part of this league and this game in this country, then there's got to be more, especially when you're talking about cities that size, right? We talk about, and not just us, Teams like Dallas or Philly get talked about in MLS circles like small markets. These are not small markets. I believe they're both top five in the country. These are big, big, big cities. And they have ownership groups that don't treat their teams like big market teams, straight up, right? And on the one hand, I get it, right? Because Dallas, the Hunt family, Philadelphia, Jay Sugarman. Jay Sugarman doesn't have the money that a lot of these owners have. So I think that's the main motivation there. Uh, the hunts do for certain. I get it. They've invested millions of dollars into this, tens of millions of dollars, maybe even more, maybe hundreds. And they haven't seen operational returns on that money. So who are we to sit here and say, hey, spend 15, 20 million dollars more a year on this team. It's not going to get you great returns in terms of revenue. It's probably not going to get you immediate returns on the field. Um, and it might not make you that much more of a thing in your community. But you got to do it. Right? Who are we to say that? Right? Especially when they're sitting back here and, and saying, why would I do that? My franchise valuation has gone up 20, 30 times in the last 10, 15 years. Like, why would I do that? Um, so I, 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 I get it. But you know, you know who can say those things, Paul? The owners that are actually doing it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you the know, ones who are and, getting and, sick and tired of yeah. Of, and of like Dallas. this is this is like MLS's free rider problem, man. 
because these valuations have gone up in large part because of what people like Arthur Blank and what people like the LAFC owners and the Toronto owners and what have you are doing, right? And they are the ones pushing the league forward. And meanwhile, the Dallas and the Hunts and Philly and Colorado and San Jose, they can all sit back in the cut and be like, yeah, I'm just going to limit my costs and watch this valuation go through the roof. And, you know, maybe I'll make some real estate money on the side. And that's a good business, right? I might lose a few million bucks a year, but I'm passively making way more than that in terms of my valuation. And, and those few million bucks a year, uh, let's just write it off. It's not quite as much as a few million bucks a year looks like, right? So <laughs> I don't know if I'm Arthur Blank or an owner like him, I'm going to these guys and be like, yo, it's time to start pulling your weight. And MLS thankfully doesn't have as many owners who are just, you know, along for the ride as they used to. Um, and that's a good thing, but there are still some, and I would include San Jose and DC both in that group. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I think if like, we want to just like basically say, what is the ideal MLS owner looks like? Well, it looks like Arthur Blank or Joe Mansueto. Like let's, let's be frank, right? Both owners who have come in and basically said, what do you need to be successful? Here is the money to do it. Yeah. You know, for, for Chicago. And by the way, look at Atlanta. Like they're probably one of the few profitable teams in the league, I would guess. Definitely. You know, like, like Arthur Blank has more motivation to keep spending than does Joe Mansueto at this point in time, <laughs> you know, but yeah. that's, that's what it looks like. It, it's, it's a, it's a willingness to try to be successful by spending money and caring a little bit less about the short, not a little bit less, caring a lot less about the short term. Not losses, caring at all. Or not caring at all in the case of Joe <laughs> Mitsuido. And understanding that this is a long-term game you're in and that there is, I think there, you know, from sitting down with Joe Mitsuido, I think there is a bit of civic, like, it's like, a, yeah. I don't want to call it a toy, but it's like, this is something that represents the city that he loves. He wants it to become a thing. He's not doing it just to, he's not doing it to make money. He's not doing it to flip it in a few years. He's doing it to be a part of his legacy. And, yeah. and that creates a different type of motivation in an owner that I think is, you know, an ideal in that, you know, it's not about the bottom line. And that always changes the equation about what you're capable, yeah. what you're able to do. Paul, we talked about man. Sweet. Was it last week or the week before? I can't even remember. I think it was last week. But I had somebody who's who really knows the landscape both here and in Europe text me after that. And he was like, man, that Mansueto interview blew my mind. He's <laughs> like, I knew how much he was spending, but I'd never really like thought about it all together at once. And like you look at how much money he's spending, you look at like you guess what he's probably getting back in return. And like this guy is like clearly in it, right? He is in it. And it's telling. Right. Like, first of all, it's like, OK, this is sort of the ideal MLS owner. It's like a benevolent soccer loving person who wants to create something really cool for his city and wants to grow the sport in this country, regardless of the fact that he's setting hundreds of millions of dollars on fire in the short term. No pun intended. Um, like, that's what you need. Right. But like, isn't that also like a little bit? It's a little bit concerning. I don't know if it's damning. It's definitely scary. That like if MLS is going to get to the place it wants to get, and it, and and if it if it's going to get there with the speed that people like you and I and probably a lot of people listening to the show want want it to get there, it's going to require like twenty of Joe Mansueto, and there aren't twenty Joe Mansuetos right now. Right? I mean, yes and no, Sam. I mean, you don't have to be Joe Mansueto if you're Arthur Blank making money every year because sure, you're putting, you know, but, but Paul, David but Tepper, Paul, we like talk about they, this, but we talk about this. It's much easier to do what Arthur Blank is doing when you're starting with, again, no pun intended, a blank canvas. MLS has maybe three expansion slots left. There are very few blank canvases left. And sure. so you're, you're going to start getting to a place where the only time places new owners like a Joe Mansueto can come in and do what Joe Mansueto is doing is, is in a legacy market where there's 20, 30, who knows, 35, 40 years down the road um, of history of, of failure, right? Yeah. But but you don't it doesn't I just think that you need some Joe Mansuetos and Arthur Blanks and MLS is starting to get them 
Arthur Blank and Joe Mincueto, and I think LAFC <laughs> would be on board with this. And yeah, Toronto. and Toronto. And yeah, there, there's Toronto. a small conglomerate. The Moss brothers are certainly on board with with changing the way things Cincinnati, are done. Cincinnati. Yeah. Cincinnati is spending at that level. Got to you know, have I, some better execution think, in those last two you're, places. <laughs> you're also you're also seeing owners who are coming in and taking these teams away from owners who can't spend at that level and are spending more money, maybe not completely at the level of Mansueto yeah. or Arthur Blank, but you know, that Houston. are improving those markets, Houston, uh, Orlando, Salt Lake and potentially theory. Salt Lake. We, yeah. we don't know yet, but potentially. And so there are these places where this can happen. The question is, are those owners going to be able to come together and make change you know, to actually affect change in MLS. And this is another thing. A lot of questions, people in the comments or on Twitter from the piece I wrote about San Jose earlier this week is like, hey, can MLS actually do anything about an owner like John Fisher, right? Like what levers can the league pull to like motivate this person to try harder, right? And I need to look into it a little bit more, but at the end of the day, they can't pull that many levers. And I was talking to a source about this and, and the source was, sort of saying, you know, one thing that David Stern, the late NBA commissioner who oversaw that league's transformation from kind of a niche mid-level thing into a phenomenon, um, one thing that he was really good at was like basically acting like a political whip, like a majority, a minority whip in the House of Representatives and whipping his owners, like basically to go get those other owners that were lagging behind to drag them up. Right. And to get them into shape, because a lot of times the only lever you have or the best lever you have in these situations is shame and peer pressure. Right. Like that's what these guys respond to. Right. John Fisher, for instance, he's behaving in a completely rational way from a financial standpoint, like a completely rational. Way. The Quakes are valued at five hundred and ten million right now. He bought in as part of a group that paid a twenty million dollar expansion fee 15 years ago. Why wouldn't he continue acting how he's acting from that perspective, right? Well, basically, the only reason is if you have the owners at the Board of Governors meeting at this high school cafeteria glorified, bully him into <laughs> changing his behavior, right? To be clear, we do not advocate bullying. Not bully, but peer pressure, him, basically. And being like, John, like we're all pulling our weight. You're not. And we're seeding this market that should be great for MLS. And you can say this. You can go down the line. You can say it for D.C., you can say it to a degree for Dallas, um, and and you know maybe that's a way that that Don Garber and these other owners can force change. And Paul, we we talk about it all the time. That mass, that critical mass, is building. There are more owners that are like this now than there ever have been. So we'll see if they get there. It's not just that. There's frustration building. You know, at least from what our sources are telling us, there's frustration building with some owners who have been okay, kind of doing their thing and and spending the way they want, who are now looking around the league being like, you know, this is this is BS. Yeah. You know, this is not okay. And the question is, when will they when will they start to talk about that at the BOG table? When yeah. will they start and, to advocate? And when will they start to talk to us about it, Paul? That's right. Most importantly. <laughs> Arthur Blank, call me up. Call me up, man. <laughs> Go talk to your PR guy. He has my number. Um, <laughs> oh man, you have anything else that I think this is a good place to end this segment and transition into the final one, where we can talk more about some owners in a situation going on down in Miami, some trouble in Columbus, some dual national stuff, some cup sets, U.S. Open Cup back in action this week. So, last chance saloon here, Paul. You got anything else you want to say? No, just, uh, you know, again, there is no, you know, there is no perfect formula for an owner unless you're Joe Mansueto and wow. Arthur Blank. And if you're and if or Toronto and LAFC who are trying, really, that's what it comes down just to. Just try. Right? Just yeah. try. Just try. Like, just try. Genuinely baby. try, though. Not like fake try, like real trying. And just we try. know when you're trying and when you're not. OK, it's very obvious. Just that's try. All. Stay with us, Allocation Disorder. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by our old friends over at Artifact. All right, everybody. Let's talk about your mom. Isn't she the best? But Mother's Day is less than a month away, and if you're being honest, you probably haven't even started to think about what you're going to give her. 
Well, friends, here's what you're going to do. You're going to get some help from Artifact, and you're going to give your mom the opportunity to record the story of her life in her own words as only she can tell it. Because you know her like nobody else, but your kids know her as grandma. And to their kids, this amazing, amazing woman will just be a face in an old grainy photo. Don't let that happen. Artifact is how thousands of families pass down the stories of where they came from. It's the kind of gift that says, hey mom, I love you in the moment. And oh my god, I'm so glad I did this in 10 or 20 years. And that is a lovely combination. Here's how it works. Artifact sets your mom up with a professional interviewer who will guide her through the chapters of her life. From childhood and teenage years to coming of age to family life and career, you can start with a single chapter of your choosing. Interviews are recorded remotely over the phone or the computer. Artifact then edits each conversation into a private studio quality episode that can be shared instantly with whomever you choose and only those people. You can add photos and comments and reactions, creating an instant heirloom that your family will pass on for generations. And just in case you're hearing this and thinking, well, that's cool, but it probably costs thousands of dollars this is not so. Artifacts start at $119 for a single episode, and three or more episodes cost just $99 each. And you can save $20 on your first artifact with the code TSSMOM. Go to heyartifact.com slash mom and enter the code TSSMOM at checkout. Once again, that's heyartifact.com slash mom and TSSMOM, all one word, all uppercase, to save $20 on your first artifact. Thank you to our friends at Artifact for sponsoring today's show. Today's episode is brought to you by Sunday. It might be hard to imagine, for certain parts of the country at least, but spring is almost here. It is currently showering outside. I believe spring showers is a thing, or are things. We are so close to feeling soft grass under our feet, but that means we first need to get our lawn back, back under control, back in order, or operating at all. Thankfully, Sunday gets your lawn growing and helps you keep it healthy all season long, and it does so without having to use million, literally millions of pounds of chemicals, because that is the number of pesticides that are put onto lawns each year. Sunday is different. They can help you grow a beautiful lawn without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. Their custom plans include fertilizer and everything you need to easily care for your lawn, and with ingredients like seaweed, iron, and molasses, you can feel good with kids and pets being around, which was a big thing for us because our dogs continue to dig. They're going to get into stuff. They're going to sniff. And I did not want to run the risk of them ingesting a bunch of chemicals. And that's another reason why we love us some Sunday. All you have to do is attach the ready-to-use pouch to a garden hose and spray. It takes fewer than 15 minutes. And Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off. You can get a full season plan starting at just $129. And then you get 20% off at checkout when you visit GetSunday.com slash TSS. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash TSS. Thank you to Sunday for sponsoring today's episode. Welcome back to Allocation Disorder. Sam, you alluded to this at the end of the last segment, but... Uh, there is more trouble potentially in South Florida. It's never been mm, easy yes. oh, yeah, in Miami. Difficult word. And this is a saga that's been going on since Beckham first announced he was taking his team to Miami. And that is essentially where are they going to play? They have a temporary stadium. They have a they had a plot of land for a stadium. Then they decided they didn't want that plot of land. Now they have another plot of land. And there is a vote upcoming, Sam. And it's a big vote. For inner Miami, it will determine whether or not that plot of land becomes their stadium. You've been doing some reporting on what's happening around the stadium. What's the deal right now, Sam? Yeah, so we're presumably, it looks like we're in the final stretch. And I say presumably and looks like because this vote has been delayed four times since... <laughs> since the start of February. So who knows if it will actually happen, but it's currently scheduled for next Thursday, April 28th, Miami city commissioners of which there are five will be taking a look at a lease that was sort of negotiated between the city and the inter Miami ownership group for Melrose golf course for 99 years. And the plan is for Jorge Moss and David Beckham and co to redevelop that golf course to build a 25,000, seat soccer specific stadium on that course um but and this is probably the main motivation uh 
to develop it commercially and to build hotels and 400,000 square feet of office space and create something called a tech hub um, and also in include a 58 acre park because there are a lot of laws and rules where they can't be reducing this parkland and, and all of these things. So there's a lot going on here. Um, they need to get four out of five commissioners to say yes, to vote, to get this project through. One is a hard no and has been for years since this thing came through in 2018 and was put on a ballot. Um, whether or not basically they, they would, Miami would go forward with a no bid process and just negotiate strictly with the inner Miami group for this piece of land. Um, there have been a million different twists and turns. It would take a long time to run all of those down. So I don't really have, we don't have to do that here. Um, but it's going to be interesting to say the least to see if it goes through. And, and this is sort of popped this week because Billy Corbin, who's a filmmaker, um, document documentarian and kind of local uh, activist down in South Florida and in Miami made a video that he released on Twitter earlier this week, basically slamming this effort uh, to build the stadium and to redevelop this property, which right now is a golf course, but a public golf course in Miami. Um, and the person narrating this video was, was David Sampson. For those of you who do not know, David Sampson was the former president of the Florida and then Miami Marlins. Um, he was the one that built the stadium, got Marlins Park built. Um, that stadium infamously, uh, until the Buffalo Bills recent deal with upstate New York and the county and Buffalo up there, um, was kind of widely considered the biggest, I don't know, what's the word, Paul? Grift? Uh, robbing of taxpayers? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Worst when you're, stadium deal. When I mean. you're talking about welfare for, for mi hundred millionaires and billionaires to build stadiums for them, for their own private organizations, that was the worst one. And it really kind of paused it nationwide, right? And so that video really equated the two deals. And David Sampson is saying, I was the president of the Marlins. I know what this looks like when you're getting effed, Miami, and you're getting effed. And it's different than the Marlins deal. I think that needs to be said. The Marlins deal was paid for by bonds from the city that were issued that the city's having to pay interest on every single year. Um, this deal would be privately financed by Jorge Mas and his group. Um, what the issue is, is are they getting proper value? Are, is Miami getting proper value for this land? And are they getting paid enough money for it? And um, so we'll see. We'll see if the vote gets even happens next week. Um, but if it does and it gets approved, then Miami can finally start really the process of, of trying to break ground. There's a lot that has to happen before they can even do that. Environmental concerns. Turns out that land is extremely contaminated, um, <laughs> which depending on who you talk to is normal or not for a golf course. Um, so they, they have a 30 plus million dollar project of cleaning that up before they can actually start construction. So there's a long way to go before they're not playing in Fort Lauderdale. Um, if they say no, then Miami has to move to a different different plan. Um, maybe they head back to Overtown, uh, a site that they were considering before they, they looked at Melrose. But I think the key thing there is that that Overtown site's a lot smaller. And what does that mean, Paul? That no means real less estate. real estate development. That means those office spaces, those hotels, that tech hub, those parking lots, all that stuff, a lot less room for it. Um, and that means a lot less money for the inner Miami ownership group. So that's part of this deal. And that's why they want to build it on the big plot of land at Melrose. So keep your eye on that. It's going to be a huge moment for them. And, uh, we'll see if the, if the dream is alive or if it gets deferred slash moved. Um, but anyway, that's probably boring to some of you so we can move on to different, more fun topics. Paul, us open cup, man, it's back. And we had some upsets. Some cup sets. Actually. What was your favorite cup set? Oh, by far, it was the hailstorm in yeah. Salt Lake. I mean, how could it not be? 19, Northern 000. Colorado hailstorm FC. Just mm, chef's incredible. kiss. Really incredible. Um, 19,000 people at the stadium in Salt Lake at Rio Tinto. And the hailstorm, which has not yet played a home game, which has played, has existed for two weeks, which has played just one game together before this game and they win at salt lake one nothing to move on how is that, that that by far the best story so far i mean detroit city moving up to usl championship knocking out columbus crew um that's a good one i think um 
And, and speaking of Columbus, can we transition to a second? We haven't spent much time on US Open Cup, so we can put a pin if you want. Are we good to move to, to the Columbus crew? Just, we just wanted to talk about the hailstorm. Yeah, I mean, we kind of did. Um, sky sort of falling in central Ohio. They won MLS Cup in 2020. Obviously a very strange season. 2021, they missed the playoffs because Caleb Porter cannot make the playoffs two years in a row. Everyone knows this. It is law. Um, but usually he doesn't miss the playoffs two years in a row. And Columbus are in a, a large skid right now. Um, he's not happy, <laughs> clearly. Uh, he did not talk to the press after they lost to the U.S. Open Cup to Detroit City, which is never a good sign. Just ask Matias Almeida. Um, Paul, you think you think there's smoke here? You think there's fire? You think we could be on our way to potentially a coaching change? What's going on with the crew? Yeah, I mean, look, I think we've spoken about this before. Caleb Porter is volatile. He is a personality that runs hot, I think, all the time. And or almost all the time. You, yeah, you can get him kind of chill occasionally. Um, he's feisty. Yeah. And and so do I think that there's smoke or fire here? Yeah, because I think that he's, you know, a personality. I remember when he left Portland and talking to um, Gavin Wilkinson and Merritt Paulson in the days after that decision and the quotes continue like from all three of them, the quotes are like, oh, we have a great relationship. This is like a, you know, a mutual decision. Um, it's actually amazing that the three of us have lasted this long. Like that was like the quote <laughs> and the themes. Like it was like, you know, it's very difficult to to kind of maintain these relationships for for as long as we have, and and we've done a great job, and that's why we're still friends. But like we've kind of reached our natural conclusion, you know. And so, I mean, I I would imagine that there's some of that happening with Caleb. Like you you hit these these breaking points with those types of personalities that are so intense. Yeah. And and so what happens now? I don't know. I mean, probably depends on if the results start to turn. Yeah. And and if the results turn, then, you know, is there a coaching change? I don't I don't know. But if they don't. It's trouble. I could see it. Um, I think an interest, you know, the the Portland comparison is interesting um, or the note that you made there is interesting. Because I don't, and I was talking to somebody who's familiar with the situation in Columbus yesterday on Wednesday, and sort of going back and forth between Portland and, and, and the crew. And we were talking, and, and we sort of came to the conclusion, Portland had those big personalities besides Caleb Porter, right? Um, certainly in the front office, but also, you know, even among players. Uh, Columbus doesn't really have that same type of, they don't have those same type of people, Right. They're competitive. Don't get me wrong. No one gets to that level without being competitive. But I don't know that the crew really have the type of people in the front office or the locker room that are really going to check Caleb in a way that maybe Merritt Paulson or Gavin Wilkinson would have. Right. And so I think that's part of this. But I think, you know, anytime you're saying the things that he's saying in, in the press and talking about how your team needs to be like your strikers need neck tattoos and they're too nice and you know they're like sort of insinuating that they're soft and so on and so forth you're in the risk of losing the locker room and anytime you lose the locker room it's hard to come back from that if you're a head coach so we'll see you know i think these next few weeks are really crucial for him um if they can start winning games everyone will feel better and we'll look back on this as a funny little episode uh if they don't then i'm very very curious to see what what columbus does um, yeah. so yeah, that's certainly well, one worth keeping an eye on. I, I think there's two more facts that we should put out there that would, would factor in here. One is that the general manager, the, I think he's now president of the club as well. Tim Bezbachenko was hired after Caleb Porter. Yeah. Thank um, you. Which, Pointing which is a significant yeah. point in that, you know, Merritt Paulson and Gavin Wilkinson hired Caleb Bezbachenko did not. And I think that's notable, but also that when they hired Caleb Porter, they gave him a big fat guaranteed contract and he still has another year guaranteed after this, I, I believe. Yeah, he, he's he's paid, you know, well, and I don't know. I don't know what the owners will do. We they, this they're new with the with the crew. You know, yeah. we they've, they've not been shy in in with their NFL team as far as no, coaching changes go. Certainly not. Um, so maybe that's indicative of what would happen if they reached a breaking point. But 
I just think those two things are are worth keeping in mind in regards to the Caleb Porter situation. For those who don't know, the Haslam's own own the crew and the Cleveland Browns. So, um, you know, that paragon of success, uh, <laughs> the Cleveland Browns and virtue these days as well. Um, Paul, we have some dual national news as well. Jonathan Gomez, he's been in U.S. camps before, um, apparently accepting a call to the Mexico national team. Uh, for I believe their upcoming friendly next week. Yeah, against Guatemala. Against Guatemala, uh, he is currently with Real Sociedad, playing with their reserves over in Spain, formerly of Louisville City in USL, and before that, the FC Dallas Academy. And a guy in your neck of the woods, Gaga Slonina, um, who keeps getting shout outs in MLS, not facing a ton of shots. I think it's important to point that out. <laughs> uh, I don't think the Galaxy had a single one on goal on Saturday. Um, but but keeping the zero, so that's good. Young goalkeeper, everyone thinks he's very, very talented. Um, he is a Polish dual national, and Poland is apparently getting set to call him up. He has also been involved with the USMNT and was even with them during one of the qualifying camps. Um, what do we make of this? Should people be freaking out? Um, is this legit between Slonina and, 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 and Poland? Or, you know, are we all going gaga over a bad romance, Paul? Just going to let that sit there for a second. Um, Just stewing it. You know how I feel about dual national panic and dual national talk. Do I? I don't know that I did. And, 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 <laughs> and the way I feel about it is, if you don't, the way I feel about it is this. Look, these are incredibly, at some point, these kids have to make these decisions. And they're incredibly personal. It goes back to when I recorded, when we recorded the episode after the game in Costa Rica. And the feelings that I was feeling in that stadium when those anthems were playing, you know, I don't feel it's not about, do I feel more American or do I feel more Costa Rican? I am half American and half Costa Rican by blood. Like that is just who I am. And that's how it is for these kids. And those, you know, the feelings that you have are, they all are related to how you grew up and your, your relationship with your family and, and the way you were raised at home and what things were like. And, yeah, sometimes the pressure you feel from friends and family and the pressure you feel from the outside world, all of these things are factoring in, but ultimately it's going to come down to like a personal decision. And so I get the thing that frustrates me is when it's like, oh, like what can we do to like, what can U.S. soccer do better? Or what can Greg Berhalter yeah. do to not lose these guys? And with both of these players, I think they've done exactly what they need to do, which is call them into camp with the senior national team you know, certainly with Gaga Slonina with the youth national teams as well. I don't know if Gomez has, I, I haven't looked at Gomez's background to see how often he was called into the youth national teams, but mm -hmm. you know, they both been, they both played for the U S senior national team in the lat or, or been in camp with the U S senior national team in the last six months, they've mm -hmm. been exposed to the environment and, and now it's up to them if they want to go and go to like Jonathan Gomez, the report is he wants to go and see what camp is like in Mexico, just like Araujo, and just like Efra Alvarez. Why not, and, man? And if explore Slovenia options. wants to explore the option with Poland, by all means, go ahead. But it's going to come down to their decisions. I would say that the idea that these players should be cap tied simply to end their ability to make a decision is ridiculous. And, you know, I hope that these players are given the space and the consideration that they deserve and understanding of what it feels like to have to choose a country, you know, it, no other place in the world do you have to make a choice like this that has, you know, that has like professional implications. Like, it's just okay. a very awkward thing that, that you have to like, that you're going to be perceived as picking one more than the other. It's just weird. Yeah. And, and it's also a very normal thing in the world of international soccer these days. And I think your point about what can U.S. soccer do, I think I think Greg Berhalter has done a nice job in this area. And Ernie Stewart and Brian McBride, Ernie Stewart himself, a dual national um, as well. So, uh, you know, you let the chips fall where they may. Obviously, it's an incredibly personal decision, as you just said. Uh, there's also, like, you know, a business element to these decisions, too, for these players. Um, and I'm not talking about money necessarily, but professional opportunities um, and all of that. And that's part of it. It's head and heart for these guys. Um, and how where you fall on that spectrum is it's very individual and personal and everyone does it differently. Right. So but yeah, I, I would echo what you said in terms of U.S. soccer and what they can do. And it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. You know what? You know, we've seen impossible um, to 
Yeah, Jonathan Gonzalez yeah. was one dual national who looked like he was going to be a big star and hasn't been with the national team. Efra Alvarez hasn't really factored in too much with, with the Mexican national team. Julian Araujo, like, could yeah, go to the gonna World be, Cup with Mexico. Probably gonna be would be going to the World Cup with the U.S. You know, yeah. you you just don't know, um, yeah, how how these careers will shake out. Obviously, if we want to get into it really quick, Gaga Slonina is the the top young goalkeeping prospect in this country, and so that would be yeah, that would that would not be ideal to lose him. Jonathan Gomez yeah. plays a position of need for the U.S. at left back. If he continues to develop. Yeah, it would not be ideal to lose a left back prospect at a position that's, you know, typically been volatile. But, you know, it's going to come down to what these kids want. Yeah, absolutely. Bad week for the Slonina news to come out, just in terms of the anxiety of USMNT fan base, considering what we saw from Zach Steffen over the weekend. Um, but that's a different discussion entirely. Real quick, Paul, just kind of wrapping up here. Um, a couple other notes. Chris Richards out with an injury. Looks like he's going to be out three to four weeks, which will I think put his his involvement for the June camp into question. Um Weston McKenney obviously still dealing with his injury. Gio Reyna still dealing with his injury. Unfortunate timing for the US because that June camp is kind of the last long chance to really get this group together and work out the kinks and, and kind of push forward ahead of Qatar. It will be interesting though in that it allows Greg Berhalter to to introduce some new faces. And I think that's that this is the one camp to do it. Take a look at guys like we've talked about on this podcast before, you know, guys like Georgie Mihalovic and, you know, maybe Haji Wright and, and, and those players who are on the fringe and give them the opportunity to make an impression. And um, I think Greg Berhalter said it on his podcast with Bobby Warshaw that he hopes that he can introduce some new faces um, in June. So I, I'd expect that. Yep. We will see. We'll find out probably in about a month. So plenty of time to talk about it before then. Plenty of time to talk about other stuff. We talked about a lot on this show. Thank you for sticking with us through it. If you watched on YouTube, thank you for that. Let us know what you're thinking of our presentation, I guess. You know, like if you think my hair is dumb. Well, just don't I wore a Boca Juniors jersey and you couldn't really see it on this episode. Just don't, I did I did that me. just for McKelly and, and Nico Cantor, basically. So wow. Okay. Well, we'll find out if they listen now. They're on the spot. Thanks for listening to Allocation Disorder. I'm Sam. He's Paul. We'll be back next week.